There you go. Is this okay for you, Mike? There? <laughs> yeah. Try that. Everything has to be right for Mike. <laughs> Hi, as you heard, my name's Ken Scott. Uh, I'm next January, I would have been working in recording studios for 60 years. So uh, I'm a dinosaur. So we're here, although it was mentioned about David Bowie remasters, we're not allowed to talk too much about those, are we? No, no. it's a certain so thing, yeah. We'll just, we'll see how it goes. So my, my role here is as the dinosaur uh, to talk a little bit about when I was a mastering engineer back in 1967 and how things were then compared to John here, who's present day. And it's very, very different. I, I came into mastering because I started off at uh, Abbey Road Studios uh, when I was 16. The, the route that I went through was starting off in the tape library, then I was an assistant engineer or button pusher, and then got promoted up to mastering. Except it was called cutting then, it wasn't mastering. Uh, started off cutting playback acetates. We were, they were the only thing that uh, artists, producers, arrangers had to listen to what they'd done back at home. We didn't have cassettes, we certainly didn't have CDs or any th any th MP3s, all of that. What what tended to happen back then? I don't know if this happens these days or not. The first couple of days that we're there and we're allowed to actually cut records, we put the tape on and we'd listen to it. Yeah, yeah, that that that's good. It just needs a little bit of high end, and you turn full up on high end at ten k. <laughs> Yeah, that's better. Now, now it's lacking a bit of low end. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Put it low end. Then, yeah, now it's missing that. We need a bit of mids. And you'd go full on mids. And it would generally take two days, maybe three, if somewhere between that, uh, before you realise that you'd get the tape in, you'd think it sounds good, and one notch at ten, it's perfect. That's what you would then cut. And... That's the way it was back then. The, the, the tapes that we would get, the engineers had learned what worked. And that was why they, they, they had us mastering, cutting, before they allowed us to engineer. It's because you had to be, there are limitations with vinyl. You can't have too much high end, it would distort the cutting head. You can't have too much low end, otherwise the records would jump. So on tape you could put anything. So they wanted you to learn the limitations before they'd allow you to work on tape, which you could put anything on. And the engineers back then knew the limitations and they worked accordingly. And our job as mastering engineers was to keep it as close to what we were given as possible. The engineer and the producer knew what they were after. If they, if they wanted it to be like a reggae record, it would have lo lots of low end and you just have to be careful with that. Sometimes it'd be a lot of high end and very much Back then, the producer had very little say in what something sounded like. Uh, Norman Smith, the engineer on the uh, first five, I think it was, maybe six Beatles albums, he was the one in control of the sound. When uh, Jeff Emmerich came in, and then I came in, it was very much us and the Beatles, I have to say, that were in control of the sound. George Martin, incredible producer. I learned so much from him, but he didn't have too much say in what something sounded like. The only time I remember him actually ever commenting about sound was mixing Savoy Truffle from the, the White Album with George Harrison and George wanted a lot of high end on it. So there was a lot of high end on it, high end on it and George stuck his head in the, in the control room and said it's very bright and George, just tur George Harrison turned to George Martin and just said that's the way I want it. That was it. We didn't see George Martin back in there again for that mix. But uh, so, yeah, it, it, I'm I'm my whole philosophy with regard to, to mixing is to try and get across exactly what I want to get across. So the mastering engineer has to do as little as possible because that's the way I learned, not the way it is these days. Over to John. No, well, no, I guess not. <laughs> there is, obviously, we live in a digital age and um, <clears throat> th th there's a lot of scope to do stuff 
within a mix these days and um, it doesn't necessarily it's not necessarily going to be going onto vinyl anyway so I guess engineers don't have that mindset anymore um, so quite often when we have to cut mixes to vinyl these days there's sometimes there has to be a conversation with the mix engineer to get the best result um, and sometimes you know there's we might produce two masters as well, one for, for cutting and one for a CD or streaming um, platform. Um, yeah, so quite often if I do a master and they, there's a, they want it quite loud and dense sounding, that doesn't necessarily translate well to vinyl because obviously, as you yeah. know, it has a sound, it has this, well, its own distortion and... The, the, the question <laughs> I have for you, which mm. may, may not be the question for you, it might be more of the, the mixing engineer, mm. it, what do you make it sound good for? Because there are so many different ways of, of listening, from the computer monitors yeah, to... Yeah. Big... yeah, well, I guess the best sounding mixes are the ones that kind of sort of sit in the middle a little bit, I guess, that can... You know, sound good on anything? Yeah, yeah like a reason, you know, those. fairly competitive level, but, you know, well-balanced mix. A good mix is a good mix, the same as it was, in, you know, back in the day as it is now. And um, um, one of the most challenging things I guess with modern um, recordings and mixing is um, it's kind of the advent of the distressor kind of vocal effect where there's a lot of kind of HF distortion um, but cutting that to, to vinyl sometimes can be quite tricky because of the way distortion rises yeah um, <clears throat> so that can be a bit of a challenge yeah but yeah I mean what sounds good it's what the artist thinks and you know it's we, we just come in and, and sort of um, try and squeeze that last 10% out of their vision, I guess. That's, that's, the, that's kind of my mindset when I'm mastering a track. Okay, is good. I listen to it and I think, what are they going for here? Um, yeah, I, I've can, had Can I do it more? Can I do it, does it need a bit less? And also, how does it fit within um, the rest of the project? You know, bringing stuff together. I mean, albums are still a thing, believe it or not. And, you know, that's... Well, hopefully they are. <laughs> Jeez. Very much still part of my thinking is I like to listen to everything and get yeah. an idea of the overall sound and scope of a record before I start working on it. Do you f have much of a problem with like different mixing engineers doing different tracks on an album and m making them sound to, that it, it works It can be together. tricky, but I mean, most uh, mix engineers these days will give you um, um, a less processed version as well as a listening ref, which is typically louder for the client. Um, so that makes it a lot easier to bring stuff together for the final product. Um, but it can be, you know, it can be tricky because then you're dealing with five or six different mix engineers and trying to get notes for it all. Yeah. <laughs> it can be... You could go, oh, why isn't this one pushed it more like this one? And but the thing is, you're trying to bring it all together. And um, it well, be, it's so, interesting. You, you mentioned about making things loud. We yeah. always had a problem at Abbey Road because we could never get the records to sound as loud as the American ones. And yeah. it, it, that, even to the point of, we would get tapes from America of the American records, mm -hmm. but quite often the tapes would get held up in customs. Okay. So they would send over, let's say it was singles, they'd send over 45 singles, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and we'd cut from those. And we <laughs> still couldn't get them as loud as the Americans. <laughs> oh, wow. So, so we had exactly the same disc, thing. Disc dubs, yeah. It, it, no, that, how was the distortion, the HF distortion there, oh. doing the transfer from 45. Oh, it was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> all of them, all of them. I did a lot of the, the Motown hits. Right. And they would yeah. all come from the, the 45s. Yeah, and sure. Yeah. It didn't stop them being hits. So. No, well, that's it, yeah. That was their whole model, wasn't it? it yeah. Was, uh, but no. Uh, what tools did you have back then to deal with? It was Scully, like lathe, distortion. It was Scully lathe. I can't remember what the head was. Right. We had uh, one, it was called a curve bender. Uh, yeah, EQ, we, we, yeah. you know those. Still got one. Well, the, okay. The Chanda version, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and that was it. That's all we had. Right, so all we could do really was just cut top end. Uh, well, it, it's low, yeah. mids and highs. Yeah, yeah. That was the thing when cutting the right. playback acetates, boom, 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 yeah, on all of them. But, uh, no, I never actually mm. got to cut stereo. Right. It was it was very much if you were moved into mastering stereo, that was it. You were staying as a mastering engineer. So it was like a mono Westrex head or something, was it? 
I have no idea. I think it may have been. I don't know too much about Scully's. But... Yeah, I, it, 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 look, yeah, yeah. that was 56 years yeah, ago. Okay. I'm Why sorry. Why did you write I it down? <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Mm. No, if if you were lucky, you got moved just doing mono and then on to engineering. Yeah. It was yeah. my my luck. So when did stereo start to become a thing for you? Can you remember your first stereo mix? I don't, actually. I remember uh, whatever it was, it was very hard to do. Everything was based around mono. And let's face it, when you're recording four track and eight track, it, it's difficult to get good. Yeah, stereo mixes. Yeah, yeah. So there's that. But the, the first time with the Beatles that stereo came into uh, their lives, really, uh, I've always said if you want to hear the Beatles the way the Beatles wanted to be heard, you have to listen to the monos. Up until the White Album, definitely Abbey Road, that was only stereo. Mm. But when it came time for Abbey Road, I learnt how the the Beatles had started to get into stereo, and it wasn't necessarily anything to do with listening to it. Mixing Helter Skelter, this, I think this may have been the last session, the 36 hour session. We did the mono mix, and at the end of it, I just faded it out. Then, as it was all set, we are gonna do the stereo. So I just moved some things around, EQ was all the same, all of that. So I went through it, did it exactly the same way. I fade down at exactly the same place at the end and pulling it down. McCartney's by the side of me, he said, okay, now start fading it back up again. Said, what? Start pushing it back up again. So I start <laughs> pushing it back up again. I, okay, now bring it down fast. Okay, now bring it back up again. I got blisters on my fingers, down, boom. <laughs> I looked at him and said, what the fuck was that all about? It's nothing like the mono. He said, no, we've, we've been getting letters from the fans telling us that there are differences between the mono and the stereo. So we thought if we actually definitely made differences between the mono and stereo, we'd sell twice as many. <laughs> Always follow the money, folks. Always follow the money. <laughs> no, that was, that was when they got into the stereo. It was only at that point, up to, up to then, it was the stereos were done yeah. sometimes weeks later and it was just thrown <clears throat> together. Yeah. Well, that still happens now. It's, it's, it's called Atmos now. Yeah. That beautiful guitar part was just sitting just right in the stereo field, fly it around the room. Yeah. 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 <laughs> what do you think about that? Well, I've been getting involved in some... Atmos mastering, um, well, did you inverted commas, because it's, uh, it's the Wild West at the moment, to yeah. be honest with you, it's all very new for everyone. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I, it, to, for me, it's, it's a great tool for material that suits that environment, you know, it, a dark side of the moon, you know, sure, it, 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 that format is going to, you can get the most out of it possibly and do some really cool creative stuff with it um i've heard i've heard stuff that sounds great in atmos and i've heard stuff that's a bit underwhelming or has perhaps been pushed a little too far and doesn't really suit that 3d environment you know where things are flying around the room you know, no, I've, I've only ever heard one thing of mine that was mixed in atmos and that was the uh, greg penny version of rocket man the album track, yeah. and it blew me away. Yeah. Now, admittedly, I did hear it in Abbey Road's big Atmos room. That yeah, the nine speaker one. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And uh, no, I, I couldn't see how a 16 track recording could sound that good, that big. Yeah. So, but that, so that's the only thing for me. I, there was talk, I have to say, of uh, something we need to move, we were supposed to be moving into. Uh, there was talk of doing some Bowie stuff either Atmos or real, real, real audio with the Sony version. Mm. But it, it, everyone started to decide that it didn't seem market-wise that uh, it was taking off that much, so forget it, it didn't happen. Yeah. But, uh, so yeah, well, John and I, we met for the first time tonight, but we've actually been working together for a little while now on uh, something that I had a huge learning curve on. I, I, I suddenly, we, we came up to the 50th anniversary of uh, certain Bowie records that I did. 
And of course, it's an anniversary. We've got to make more money. We've got to put new product out. <laughs> so I got, I got a phone call. Can I listen to uh, tapes from back then? See if there's anything you can do, new mixes or, uh, or outtakes, that kind of thing. So suddenly uh, I, had, I had to learn how to work in the box at home on headphones. Oh, was that fun. <laughs> I think, well, John can say if I actually got it together or not, because... Well, I yeah, I mean, the first time we ever spoke was over the phone yeah. after I just worked on a couple of them. But they were the Hunky Dory ones. It was Hunky Dory, yeah. It was, it was, a, it was a box set <coughs> called Divine Symmetry, which yeah. was um, a reimagining, I guess, of Hunky Dory, wasn't it? It was probably a, a way of summing it up. And Ken just sent me a couple of the first mixes. I can't remember what songs they were. Um, and they sounded amazing. And I was on the phone to Ken, I said, oh, you know, that sounds so good. Like, how did you, he said, oh, just, like, I was in my bedroom with headphones on. Well, it's a spare bedroom. Spare That's, bedroom, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. My yeah. wife wouldn't let it the be small in the bedroom. bedroom yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and honestly, I mean, like, you know, quite often when people send you, um, headphone mixes, it's kind of the wild west when it comes to low end. Well, that's what I was afraid <laughs> of, yeah. Well, you said you yeah. had to add a little, I seem to remember. Yeah, I think, yeah, but like overall, just, okay. you know, uh, for taste, really, and it sounded so well balanced. But it, so, the question to you is, I guess, did, how much is that is like in, intuition, knowing the material really well? Well, it, and it's some of it being good recordings, it. yeah. I, I recorded it in the first place, so yeah, I sure. know what I did in the, in, in, yeah. when I mixed it, yeah. generally. Yeah. And uh, also, it's, it's very much, because we were working well, most of it was 16-track. Uh, we EQ'd, we did most of the stuff going on to tape. Yeah. So it, it, a lot it's of it was already there the on, on the multi-tracks. Yeah. What I did find, I had, on, on the new mixes that I did, easy. Well, once I got used to Pro Tools in the box and all that, easy. Mm -hmm. uh, but... I also had to do stems of sounding like the originals. Now that was really bloody difficult, matching up. And I still, I, I still, there are certain differences that I've, I, much as I worked on it, I couldn't get them same. The spread on a piano. Now, you'd think that from the tape to, uh, digital, it should still generally be the same, but mm. I could not get the spread anywhere near the same as the original recording. And it just very weird little things, but I was told just do the best you can. So that's what I did on those. Yeah. But, uh, no, it, was, it, was, it, was I think the first question that I asked yeah. John, once he'd, he'd, done, he'd done some some of the masters and I got to hear them was, what did you have to do to it? And because, I know that these days, mastering engineers have to make really bad things sound really good. And it could have been that way for these mixes. I had no idea. No. And no, <laughs> thank you. It sounded good. So that, that was what I was interested in. What am I, what am I lacking in? And just a little bit of low end, but that, that's... Yeah, and possibly that's just sort of kind of replicating what the master take would have done after the mix anyway. Yeah. So it's, yeah. Maybe that's the thing you were sort of missing a bit more. I, I, I don't what, know. What I, you, I know what I think. Depends what you was referencing. Yeah. I, I, well, it was the, the, the Ray's Ray EQ. The masters, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Ray being Ray Staff, who did re, re, re masters some time back. Uh, I think one of the differences is Dolby's. Because the, we used to use the, the big stereo Dolby's take up a lot of room and now they use when they transfer them they use the, the slimline Dolby A's I think they are yeah, yeah. To, to do it and uh, I, I don't think they work the same way no so but that's a tangent to what we're talking about tonight as such so yeah we, we had we can we did the whole divine symmetry thing and it worked really well and there is the possibility that we may have worked on some other stuff after that, but we're not allowed to talk about it. So, yeah, you can you can use your was it an album imagination. That, an album that one. may have, may have been after Hunky Dory. But yeah, I, I yeah. can't remember what it was after <laughs> Hunky Dory, but <laughs> mm. yeah, yeah. I'll have to look it up on Wikipedia when I get home. <laughs> yeah. So I all I. I when I start running out of words, and I don't know if John... Yeah, I, was just, well, I was going to ask you, actually, oh. whether you've, you've heard any of the half-speed remasters we've done. Oh, yes. Yeah. 
The only one I've heard was uh, Alan Insane. Yeah. And that was, was that Alan Insane? <laughs> yes, it yeah. was. And that sounded amazing. It was the, oh, cool. the best that I had heard in years. And uh, now it was on a really good system. It might sound shit on a regular system, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, it sounded really, really good. And oh, congratulations cool. on that, because I, I wouldn't have thought it would have made that much difference, but it did. Yeah, no, it was interesting. We did quite, we did some tests, well, just some test acetates before actually deciding whether it was worth going with. Um, and if anyone who doesn't know half-speed vinyl mastering is where you record the lacquer, but you half the speed of the turntable, you half the audio content, so that hard to cut high frequencies become easier to cut mid frequencies. So when you reproduce it at full speed, you get better transients, better sound stage, and sort of audio filey stuff. But yeah, sounds a bit nicer in the top how end. Does it, yeah. How does it work with the, the low end? Oh, well, okay. Obviously, okay. It's very perceptive. Okay, uh, yeah, that's, there could be a trade-off for the low end, because obviously, say you've got like a 50 hertz tone, yeah, and it becomes take it down to 25. 20, 25, yeah. then you get right. into sort of the non-linear yeah. part of the electronics and stuff, and um, so you've got to manage the low end. You've got to manage the low end and do some so tests. My, my training and also, it depends on the material. Like Bowie stuff, it's rock and roll. The, the, the bass is, you know, it's... But it's, my, my a lot training of, of not having and, too much yeah. low end because of vinyl yeah. paid off for yeah, that, Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. It works, it works really well on <laughs> yeah. that sort of music. But you've got like a, a bass-driven record, reggae record, or like yeah. anything that's uh, electronic music. It's got a lot of bass. It, and it might not necessarily be the best choice to do a half-speed Master. Yeah. I mean, we don't see it as mastering engineers. We don't really see it as a marketing tool or something to sell anyway. We see it as just another tool, something that might work better for one thing or the other. Yeah. But you said you started off earlier on. You said you started off. You did a a, a test on Hunky Dory. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So we did. Um, so I think it was Ray was still here, or he was um, the presence of Ray was still lingering, and um, <laughs> which <happens>. he was. <laughs> he was a. Uh, we, yeah, we did. We 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 had the first uh, mods done on the lathe to 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 take it down to half speed, and we did that as a test. It didn't sound right. <laughs> I, mean, I played it to Ray, and it was like, it doesn't sound like the record. I think maybe it just needs to be cut at normal speed, and that's how it should sound. And then we sort of realised, like, well, actually, is there something else going on here? And then we pulled some of our good friends who are the, the lathe geniuses in to and they're like oh yeah well that's probably because you need to recap your swipe power supply and basically they came in and um just recapped everything on the lathe and gave everything a good spruce up um and brought it up to the standard of some of the other laves they worked on in london and then we started to and then nige nigel reeve who's the a and r for bowie um he expressed an interest of doing ziggy stardust in half speed and then when we tried that, it worked great. And then, so I've never had a chance to go back and see if Hunky Dory sounded loads better with the the, the, the mood of modifications, but it was... I'll speak with Nigel, don't worry. Yeah, yeah, I'll get yeah. you that bit of work. <laughs> yeah, cheers, cheers again. Because um, the, the other yeah. thing with half speed mastering is that they get to charge twice as much because it takes <laughs> twice as long. As I said, it's not a market at all. Um, <laughs> yeah. 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 It takes more than twice as long to do. Oh, yeah, it right, well. okay. Yeah. Twice the amount of love as well, though. Yeah. <laughs> Although, that's not true, because you have to listen to it in half speed as well. So, changes. <laughs> I, I, I used to have to master uh, some avant-garde jazz albums. I would drop the needle and I'd walk knowing that it was 25 minutes long. I'd come back in in 24 minutes and that was it. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I, I know that, having to sit through it. Yeah. Any questions? Throw it open, because... <laughs> At the back. Hi, Ken. So Hi. I'm just starting out myself. I'm 21. I've just left university. And I was wondering if you have any advice you'd give someone like me to just talk. Sort of where to go and really kind of how to get into this industry. <laughs> I always give exactly the same advice. <laughs> well, that, <clears throat> it's a bit too late for that one. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's, I got my start. I knew what I had to do at the age of 12 and a half. So it was working towards working in a recording studio, which no one knew what a recording studio was back then. For some reason, I hooked into it and knew that's what I've got to do. 
And I was 16, I was fed up with school. One Friday I wrote 10 letters, sent them out any place I could find that needed someone that might be called a recording engineer. That would have been radio stations, TV, record. There were very few that you could find in the phone book. And I sent those out and sent them out on the Saturday. On the Tuesday, I got a phone call. They wanted to interview me the next day, the Wednesday. I uh, crossed London because I was from South East London and I had to go to uh, North West London. And interviewed the Friday uh, I got the phone call that I got the job they wanted me to start following that following Monday so within nine days my whole life changed because the place that I started at was Abbey Road no idea at that time it was going to become the most famous recording studio in the world but uh, just amazing and I always put that down to uh, two things one is letters and I think letters today stand up just as much if not more than they did back then because now it's all emails or something and I, I think we're all the same with emails that oh yeah right put it in the spam put it in the spam put it in the spam and studio managers are exactly like that of course because they're getting they're getting emails all the time <laughs> Also, unfortunately, I get a lot of emails and occasionally a letter, and I'll always reply to every single one. But unfortunately, there's so few studios and so few jobs, it's yeah. very, very, very difficult. No, absolutely. But so I will always reply to every single request that I get. Okay. And this gentleman will attest because I reply to him today. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what I was going to say, you say you're getting so many, but a, do you feel that a letter, a handwritten letter, stands out more so than an email? Yeah, but unfortunately the jobs aren't there. Yeah, well, that's the trouble. but if you're trying, if, if that's what you have to do, if you, if your only number one thing is I've got to work in a studio, you, and to try and find your way into a studio, shouldn't you use the, the, the method that's going to stand out the most? Yes, of course you should, but the jobs just aren't there. No. And there's, there's so many people going to the recording studio um, training and... So, forget everything I've said so far. Go back to university and become an attorney. <laughs> Mark, Marco's now leaving to just go and find a job somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> they, they were telling me when I was 20 years ago that there was no jobs in the industry. <laughs> Yeah, I'm right. still knocking about, so, yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, first of all, thank you for the music. Oh, my, my pleasure. And thank, I, I always just thank everyone for, for buying it and listening to it, because if no one bought it, well, I wouldn't have had the life I had. It wasn't for us to buy it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but have you got any beautiful tidbits from Bowie Studio Sessions that you can give us? <laughs> other, other the, 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 the most beautiful thing for me is that has never happened at any other time of the four albums I co-produced with him uh, 90 to 95 percent of the vocals were one take first take beginning to end and it, I'd run the tape a little get him to sing just to get the level and the sound go back hit record and what he did that one time through is what you hear now and it, it's just <clears throat> like five years the opening track on Ziggy by the end of it, he was bawling his eyes out. The tears were pouring down his face. Yeah, right. It was just, oh my God, that's astounding. And it, 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 it's, I've never found anyone quite like that. And interestingly, I, I, I recently, I was doing something at uh, Abbey Road, a, a masterclass at Abbey Road, and a guy came by, he was the engineer. I. I I know I shouldn't, but I've completely forgotten his name. That's the trouble with being this fucking old. Uh, <laughs> he was the engineer on Black Star. Yeah. And uh, we, we were talking about David and uh, how he was when he was doing that. He sounded exactly the same as he was back in the day. He, he, uh, the engineer was, was saying, be laughing and joking in the control room. He said, OK, I'm going to go and do the vocal. He'd go out there, he'd do it once, come back in and be laughing and joking. And... It was it was the one. It was he was he was amazing.
the, the ultimate performer in the studio. Now, there, w there was the time when he became famous and he was going through fan mail in Trident control room. And he pulled out one. He said, here, Rono, this, one, this one's for you. And he started to read it and it's, dear Mick, and then start going into the most lascivious things that could possibly be done to him. And Rono is, oh, oh, yes, oh, yes. He's, Love, David. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of the other things with Bowie, you could never actually believe what he said. <laughs> the Beauty Brothers. Uh, it was the last track we recorded for Hunky Dory. He came in one morning and said, I've got a new song, we've got to record this. I said, OK. He said, but don't listen to the lyrics. And I said, well, why? He said, because they don't mean anything. I wrote it specifically for the American market because they're reading everything you want or anything they want into the lyrics. So they don't mean anything. And I know for a fact that David has, heard diff has now, or did hear, ten, at least 10 different versions of what those lyrics were about. And he agreed with every single one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? It's about Alistair Crowley, wasn't it? Brothers. It was about nothing. <laughs> <laughs> That's the point. <laughs> it was whatever you wanted to read into it. If you thought it was about Alistair Crowley, then yeah. that's what it was about. <laughs> I couldn't see Patty, but. What was that quicksand? I, 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 I have a feeling it could be quicksand, yeah, thinking about it. But no, it, it yeah. What did, um, what did David think of um, Nirvana's version of uh, Madness of the World? I don't know. I didn't. I, what I, do you think? I like it. I actually prefer it to the original. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was Matt Ronson like? Oh, a sweetheart of a guy, uh, exceedingly talented, and David wouldn't have been as big as he was without him. Did he, he do a lot of the arrangement? On the yeah, yeah. Look, David was one of his many talents. Was David was amazing at picking the, the people he worked with so that he knew they would give him what he wanted without him ever having to ask them to do it. Uh, he knew what to... What, I would bring to the, the, the table uh, and showed me the trust of never ever coming to any of the mixes, uh, just leaving me to do it. And we, we never discussed whether he liked them or not. <laughs> <laughs> I, it was, I, was, I was always, well, if you asked me to do the next one, then he must have liked what I did on that one. <laughs> then we did uh, pin-ups and that was it. <laughs> now, we did do a little bit of work after that, but uh, then parted ways. Uh, yeah, and so w with, uh, I'll say the spiders, because that's the way most people know them, with, with the three of them, it, it, they knew what was wanted. They didn't have to be told. And Rono, yeah, he did all the orchestral arrangements, but a lot of the, the band arrangements were just, they played what they felt should be played. Is that kind of thing? And he was, the, the, one of the last things I did with him was, uh, it was called 1989 Stroke Dodo. And it was the, 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 the initial, it was the start of the Diamond Dogs album. He eventually split the two songs into, into two songs. Uh, for the album, but that was one of the few mixes he came along to and all the time we were working on it He kept on referencing like things like Barry White and uh, that the Philadelphia Sound at that time. That's what he wanted to get. He had English musicians. He had an English engineer It, 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 it weren't gonna happen But then he eventually moves on and goes over there with the correct people and he gets exactly what he wants without having to ask for it he was, bri he was just a brilliant guy all round. Yes. Hi. Yeah. Hi. What, what would you say the kind of creative goals of Bowie would be compared to creative goals of you know young artists today? Is that for a kickoff? Although 
he knew what he wanted to achieve and how it might make him successful, but I, it was very much making, an al making albums that we liked and hoped that other, if other people liked them, that was great, but we didn't make them specifically for other people. We made them for ourselves. And it, I couldn't make a record for someone else. I can only do what I, what I like. Uh, and he was very much the same. We were having fun, two weeks in the studio, just getting into it and doing it fast, making decisions like that, which is something else that doesn't happen these days, unfortunately. And uh, yeah, it was just, and that's why, it, it was very much like the Beatles. I, I, I think of David and the Beatles being very much alike in it's, we're gonna make the records we want and fuck everyone else if they don't like them. And th they would move. And David, David did it more than uh, the Beatles, but it was, he would go for the complete tangent and it takes a lot of guts to do that. And, but it's making a record that he wanted to make and to help with the consequences. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. Another, I'm sorry? Do you think there'll be another Bowie, another artist that's as equal in talent as he was. I would hope so. I would, I would hope so. I can't say there will be. It, it's... I think, I think there will be as long as the record companies allow them. Oh, yes. <laughs> mm. Yes. That's the answer. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's... <laughs> Do you want to come up here? <laughs> 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 Are so into the formula and the marketing formula. Yeah, not but it, allowing the artists to be the it it was like that before the Beatles. <clears throat> it took a band like that to change everything, and I I I can see that happening again at some point. But it, it's one of the things that has to happen, as far as I'm concerned, is that the whole streaming situation needs to be changed because the the funding isn't there for new bands. It, it, and it, they can't make money from, they've got to do everything themselves. And I'm sorry, there is no person alive that can do everything themselves. Uh, I, th I think you always, I don't, th you get the home musician that is the engineer, the musician and the producer. It ain't gonna work. You need that sounding board to, to tell you to you to tell you to fuck off you've you've already got it you don't need to sing it again or the complete opposite you haven't got it you've got to sing it again you need that person there all the time and i think it's the same within management i think it's the same within publishing music writing you always need that outside ear just to nudge you one way or the other uh and when they have to do it all themselves there's no one to give them that that nudge uh, and to, to base everything on bloody TikTok videos is, oh, God forbid. <laughs> Look, I, I have absolutely nothing, nothing wrong with, there's nothing wrong with, with the modern technology. What we have today is absolutely amazing. We're the problem because we have to overuse everything. And if you have a hundred plugins, you've got to use 101 plugins. It, why? Because you've got a hun you can use 199 tracks, we used to do it just as well on eight tracks. You just have to think about it and make decisions. Uh, it, uh, I'm sorry, you're just... <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's fine. Honestly, honestly this works for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Do you think that it's going to be harder for acts to break through and be different? given that the media is so segmented that if people like a particular genre, like drum and bass or whatever, they don't have to be troubled with anything else. How... I, I, hmm. I know exactly what you mean, and it's a, it's a problem that I, I see. And, but it's where does that come from? Is, is that... It, it, to me... It, the, the whole thing of there being so many choices 
it almost becomes limited because it's where do you go to? I like this, so to hell with it, I'm going to stay with this. And then, of course, you get the, the streaming whoever it is saying, oh, well, you should you like this, so you should now listen to this and listen to this and listen to this. I, I remember growing up listening to the light program and you'd be hearing uh, the goons followed by Elvis Presley, and then you'd get Ken Dodd singing, and then you got a load of rubbish a lot, a lot of the time. But that rubbish stuck at the back of your brain, and at some point or another, you can bring that forward and help to change what you're doing. It, it's not straight rock and roll. Now we've got an orchestra on the back of it, but it works. Uh, yesterday, if, if Paul hadn't been listening to the radio, we would never heard of string quartet and thought, said to George, why don't we use string quartet on this song? It worked perfectly, but no one had ever done that kind of thing before from a rock and roll band. Uh, we didn't have any choice back then. We had to listen to all of this stuff. David, thinking of him, the, 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 there was a hit single, the Hollywood Argyles, they had a hit single with uh, I forgot the name of the band and remembered the song. Now I remember the band, I can't remember the song. But uh, they, they had this hit, back, I think it was the early 60s, and the B-side of it was called Show Know Enough About Love. And in it, the main line was, was done with uh, a baritone sax and a flute playing along. David loved that. So when we came to record Moon Age Daydream for the solo of it, want to emulate that. So we did it with uh, a baritone sax and a recorder. But it, it's those kind of things that they'd, they'd stuck at the back of his mind and got to use it later. And I, that happened a lot with, with a lot of the musicians there. We were pulling things from all over the place to make something different. Now, of course, because radio is so segmented and with streaming is so segmented, we have the opportunity of hearing all of these different things, but we're not. Because there's so much, we're tending to compartmentalize everything and just stick with that one type of music. Mm. So if, if that can be broken somehow, <clears throat> somehow. Keep them raw and modern artists, Ken. Is there anybody that you're listening to at the moment or that you're interested in, in so the last 10 years that's really taken your attention? In the last 10 years? Yeah. I love the foos. Foo Fighters, it, it, Grohl, Grohl is such a great front man and it helps that they're great Bowie fans as well. <laughs> I, I went to see them when they played uh, the Leeds Festival a year ago, two years ago, I can't remember. But I was at the side of the stage and they were going through and uh, playing a bit of music that each of them liked and uh, they played Ziggy and Grohl just turned around to me and just gave a huge grin and I thought, oh, fuck yes. <laughs> <laughs> so no, they, they're great. There are some, some bands that you would never have heard of that are now non-existent. Uh, that, that's one of the things I found. I tend to do a lot of masterclasses now, uh, which are great because I don't have to deal with record companies anymore. Uh, <laughs> But what I found is I'll, I'll go in and I'll do a masterclass with this great band. Three months later, they've split. And it, it, it's, there is such a thing of we've got to become immediately successful for two reasons. I think we, we, they're ingrained with the whole thought of fame. Now it's we have to become famous. It's not we're doing this because we want to make the music we make. We've got to do it gone are those days of making the records that we like and if someone else likes it, great. Uh, but the other thing is, it, with monetarily, it's so hard for them to keep together. Yes? How was it working with Diva back in the day? Oh, that was funny. Duty Now for the Future you did, didn't you? You worked on that? It was Duty Now for yeah. the Future, yeah. It was one of my favourite albums when I was growing up. I love it. I, it was it was interesting. There, there are two bands that I've worked with that had completely sort of way out there images. Devo being one, a band called The Tubes being another. And what what was interesting was those images were very much outside of the studio. In the studio, totally professional, except for one time with Devo. They, they, 
the studio owner, I was working in a studio in North Hollywood called Chateau Recorders. The owner of the studio came in and said, I've got this guy that I want to show around. He wants to book the studio when you finished. Can he come in and, and look around? I said, yeah, sure. Brought him in and instantly he brought this stranger in, Mark, Mark Mothersborough, starts to run around the studio screaming his head off. He scared this guy shitless. And <laughs> the guy left, yeah, okay, I like the studio, thanks, and left as quickly as he could. So that was the only time in the studio that they became slightly strange. <laughs> Otherwise, it was totally professional. <laughs> I realised the kind of thread for me of being a producer as well now is that the drum sound, particularly on the Devo stuff, is not dissimilar to the early Bowie stuff. Okay. I, I, I always record drum. It has nothing to do with me. I, I, any differences? I, I always record. I always record drums exactly the same way. Which is 67s or 87s on toms. Uh, Generally speaking, uh, Cole's 4038, or 4038's over the top. Uh, bass drum is generally an RE20. Snare, these days, is a Sony C38A. Uh, and it, it's, I do the same thing. What changes the sound from drummer to drummer are A, the way the drummer plays, and B, the drum kit he uses. Yeah. I, I, I wrote a, well, co-wrote a book uh, uh, several years ago now, and my co-writer was, was producing a, a hard rock band. He said, would you like to come and engineer it for me? I said, sure. I, there's nothing makes me happier than being in the studio, whether it's engineering, producing, whatever. Went in there, and we we coming up to the, the last two tracks that we had to put down, and we were talking about it, and it was decided we needed two completely different drum sounds for it. So the drummer said, don't worry, I know what to do. He comes back in the next day and he's got two completely different drum kits. So we, set, we decide which number we want to go for first. We set up the drum kit. I put all the mics in, get the levels, get the EQ and all of that. We record the first track, got it, great. Okay, the next one, just pull all the mics back, change the drum kit, move all the mics back in. I didn't have to change a thing. But the sound, the drum sound was completely different. So it, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's, it, I, obviously I say it's not me. There is a certain amount of it which is me, but the differences come from, yeah, yeah. There's a particular sound to that, though. Those, those two records sound for me, very dry. Yeah. But if, if I remember correctly, we did try and get different drum sounds on certain tracks on that album, but I could be imagining it. But what I, I was often asked, because one of the strangest things within my career was the sudden change from the, the rock and roll side, the Beatles, uh, uh, Bowie, uh, and then suddenly doing jazz fusion band, uh, Mahavishnu Orchestra. Now, I've asked all of them several times, why me? And they say, we can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. <Okay. laughs> but uh, after that, I, I was asked, well, you say you record drum kits the same every time, but you, you take Billy Cobham's drum kit at that point. How did you record that? I said exactly the same way. I just used different, uh, I used more mics. It was exactly the same mics, but just more toms, two bass drums, exactly the same mics on the bass drum. Lid. And the only difference was it wasn't in the drum booth at Trident underneath the control room. It was actually out in the room because he wouldn't fit in there, in the drum booth. So that was, that was one of the most amazing things for me and what it did for my career, a whole new, new set of musicians to work with that were phenomenal, absolutely amazing. I, I've been blessed to work with with the cream of, of both English and American uh, artists from the 60s through to probably 90s, early 90s. It just, oh, thank you. <laughs> yes. Uh, speaking of US versus UK, like yes. what would be the, uh, what's your overall takeaway as far as pros and cons uh, with big studios in the US versus big studios in the UK? No different. I, it's, it's down to who uses them. I, I was, I, 
when I first moved over there, uh, I was working at uh, Studio D in the a on the A and M lot, which is now uh, Kermit the Frogs, I believe, Jim Henson's well, Henson's place. Uh, and I have to admit, the people there were more than slightly surprised at a my choice of mics, b where I put them in the studio, studio, and how after everyone had left, I'd put mics in the corridor to, to get distant sounds and everything. They'd never done that before there. So, but we finished up sounding just like the stuff I do over here. So it, it, it's, it's, it's down to the individual person, not necessarily the room. Oh, yeah. There is one very special room for me, and that's number two at Abbey Road, which became second home for a while. And a year ago, I was doing a, a project there with two projects interlinked uh, for uh, an, org, uh, an internet site called Pure Mix. And one of the things that we were doing was something called uh, Be a Beginning to End, I think they call it, a series that they do. And it's basically, I brought a band in that I'd worked with before. We sat around pia uh, piano, they played a bunch of songs, and I picked out which one we were going to work on. Worked on the arrangement, started to record it and all of that, and it came time. Now, initially, the, the drum sound. I wanted a big drum sound on it, so I put mics at the end, along with it. Huge, it was great. Number two studio at its best. Then when it came time for the vocal, I had him, of course, sing into a 47. And uh, it was in the middle of the studio with no baffles around whatsoever. And it was as if he was just recording right there. The room just, boom. it's one, pl one very special place that just seems to give you whatever you need at any particular time. It's, yeah, I've never come across a room like that. that that's remarkable. I'm sure they'll change it soon. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Do you monitor loud when you're mixing? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> no, they're, they're, look, they're not as good as they were, obviously, but uh, how are my ears? You heard what I did. <laughs> they look nice, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I take it that they're okay because the, that was one of the other thing, reasons for asking. It wasn't just the working in the box and on the headphones. It was, okay, how are they now? And You're very softly spoken, so I'm just wondering how loud. Oh, no, I, 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 I want to feel it. it. It's not just hearing it. It's, it. Yeah, I want that whole experience. Yeah, absolutely. I have only ever found one person that liked it louder than me, and that was uh, the bass player with, with Duran Duran. <laughs> I even had to walk out when he turned the volume up. <laughs> yeah, John liked it really, really loud. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, he would walk out and I'd turn it down and carry on working. <laughs> Question? Yeah, there's one immediately behind you. <laughs> How did you find the transition going from being an engineer to an engineer and producer, kind of that change of roles? I, I, generally speaking, I found it remarkably easy because one of the re it's interesting because there at Trident Studios, there were there were three. There were three great engineers, I'll put it that way. There was Roy Thomas Baker, there was Robin Cable, Robin Jeffrey Cable, and someone called Kem Scott. We each had our own particular type of music that we worked best on. And it was interesting that all three of us, round about the same time, decided we wanted to move into production. And the, the main reason for that was we were getting sick and tired of, of the, the whole situation. I always tell the story exactly the same way. You're sitting there, you've got the producer by the side of you, you hear this great guitar solo, and you, you just turn to him and say, you know what would great, sound great underneath this? And he says, what? A herd of trumpeting elephants. He looks at you, <laughs> you sure? I think a herd of trumpeting elephants would work perfectly under this. Okay, we'll try it. You bring in the herd of elephants, you, you get them to trump it a bit, send them away, clean up the shit, 
And uh, if it worked, it was his idea. <laughs> if it didn't work, oh, it was only Ken's idea anyway. I didn't think it would work, but I thought we should try it. And we all had got fed up with that happening. And so there, there had already been that kind of thing of thinking production-wise and making the suggestions and all of that. Only now it was, I didn't have to go through the middleman. I could make those suggestions and sink or swim by my own decisions at that, at that point. So it was just being able to make the decisions, which seems so hard these days, but uh, for m so many people. Back then it was easy. So you did make suggestions as a young engineer at Abbey Road. You, you were kind of allowed to... Oh, well, eventually. Uh, not roles were more defined in those days with oh, uh, what I assumed. Yeah, look, <laughs> that, that's it. you have to think about who I was working with so much at Abbey Road. I, part, my, no one's ever ever going to get the training that I got because number one I start off at the greatest recording studio in the world and then as a young engineer I'm working with look I the first time I ever sat behind a board and pushed up a fader and turned a knob was to record the biggest band in the fucking world which is insane but they're also they also happen to be the one band that can exper they have no monetary problems they can be in the studio as long as they want they want everything to sound different every time they record it so it, it was complete freedom to try any mics i wanted in any place that i wanted to try them any effects and there was always that thing of there was as much chance of them coming upstairs and listening and saying, oh, that sounds like shit, change it, as there was them coming upstairs and saying, oh, that sounds like shit, but I love it, we'll keep it. <laughs> so the, the, the freedom that, that that gives to learning as an engineer is just unbelievable. And I can't remember what, what, what was it that you said that prompted me on to that? I was saying that I've, I assume the roles were more defined at the end. Oh, well, yeah, right, that's it. So you're there working as the engineer with these bands, and it became, the, the whole thing became a lot younger for a little while because George, George Martin went on vacation to a Greek island for a while. So it was Chris Thomas was producing, uh, his assistant at that, that time, and me, and there was one time we recorded a song of George, George's, that, uh, a song called Not Guilty that we tried and tried and tried to get his vocal right, but he, he could never feel it properly. And it, it, his choice, he, he, never, he never liked it. He wanted to try at one point recording in the control room. We said, you're crazy, but of course, had to try it. We were playing it back and John was by the side of me and I just turned to him and jokingly, there was a small room on the side of the control room. Just jokingly, I, I turned to him and said, my God, the way you guys are going, you're going to want to record in there next. And he just looked at me. <laughs> and that was it. I thought, OK, it was a bad joke anyway. So <laughs> carried on. The next day he comes in, we're going to record a new song. It's called <laughs> Your Blues and we're going to do it in there. <laughs> and it worked. It's still one of my favourite drum sounds on that track. And that was live. It was, if someone swung around too hard that way, someone's head would have got knocked off. It was so cramped in there. It was like a broom closet almost. And uh, it worked. So suddenly making suggestions, when they start to work, they're, yeah. they're easier to, to, to make. If you keep on falling flat all the time, then uh, you give up quickly. Any yes. <laughs> Can I ask a question about apps? Because it came up earlier. I know I it's <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, And can I actually ask both? Yeah, sure. Good. You take this one to start with. <laughs> Ken, you, you were talking about the differences between mono and stereo, and I found that very interesting because, well, it's hard to generalise, but at the moment, certainly at the start of an Atmos mix, there's a belief that it has to be identical to a stereo mix. It has to be the same, down to almost a null to begin with. If you, I know you mentioned you've only heard one, if you were to approach an Atmos mix, would your take be go different in the same way as people you work with went different with the stereo? I will go first if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah, go for it, yeah. <laughs> for, for, for me, yeah. it should be a totally different experience, which means everything should, you start from scratch again. Mm. Completely new mixes. When, when there was the possibility of, of doing some of Bowie's stuff uh, in Atmos, I actually went into number two studio. I rented it myself and, and went in there 
couple of big speakers at one end, mics all the way up, to re um, just played stems and just recorded those so that when it came time to mix, which it never came time to mix, but it would, I would be able to do fresh mixes and give different listening experiences. You're actually in the room kind of thing. I, did not, I, did, I couldn't see doing it spinning all around and all of that kind of thing, mm. but just putting the, the listener in a totally different place. And everything was going great when I, when I was saying about this, yeah, sounds great, Ken, you do it, but it's going to match up to the original. <laughs> You ain't going to. Come on, guys. Yeah. Okay. What the it's, hell are you yeah. talking about? It, 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 it's it is a strange paradox, isn't it? That, yes. That's a thing. Yeah. Well, it's got to be enough like the original to. No, it yeah. just musically it has to be the same. Yeah. As long as you're not changing it musically. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm look. I'm I'm always, I've always been. I don't mind what anyone does mm. with with my recordings, whatever, uh, as long as the originals are still available. Yeah, it's certainly more of a thing in America than it is over here. Yeah. Uh, you've got like Dale Becker, for example, who does a lot of it um, over in America. Um, and to be honest with you, no one's really even tried to really hire me to, to, to be a master and engineer for that master. It tends to, I get invo I've, I've got involved almost by accident a couple of times on a couple of records that I've mastered, and they've gone, oh, we're doing Atmos, can you master it? You know, so I've, I've kind of come in through the back door and gone, yes. Mm -hmm. And sort of, you know, it's a massive learning curve for me. And um, it, and obviously it works very different from how you'd master a stereo or even a surround master, because obviously you can't bust things together. You, you've got your object bed and you've got all the, ob sorry, you've got the, the sound bed and you've got all the objects which work independently and you can't group those together and tr treat them, you know, um, uh, as a group. So you, you have to come up with processes and ways of doing it. And now it's more common to, for a workaround to do that where you, you know, you, if you want to do something dynamic, you, you, you make like a key input and you can, you know, and you can do the same with EQs, you can just put them, you can just group them together across all the objects. So it's a very different way, a more complex way of working versus doing a stereo master. What do you think of the Love's Target? What do, what do I think of the Love's Target? Yeah. I mean, it, it's, I mean, it's just something you have to work to because that's, 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 they're, they're the rules. Um, and I'm pretty sure like a lot of the streaming sites will play it back up to a certain level anyway. So. It, it, it's harder to get relative la levels between tracks on albums like you would do with a stereo album. So it's harder to have moments of quiet. And, and do you know what I mean? Because it's because you're, you're adhering to those rules and the way it's presented to the consumer is not necessarily. Would you hope for changes in the Yeah, well, I think it's going to develop anyway, and there's going to be, you know, um, more tools available for being able to actually master things. I mean, they've already got the album assembler they've made, for example, and I do quite a lot of work in that, which is just getting the, the ADM mixes, chucking them in. Um, and it, one of the rules is you have to match the, the, the deliverable, stereo deliverable. So the first thing you do is you get it in and you match it up and sample, make sure the samples line up. So, you, so if you've got a streaming sign, you, you, you go to the stereo product, it, it, you know, it, it plays roughly in time. <laughs> And so there's an element of that, and then it's it's really cool because that's got like a limiter and EQ, which will just work over the entire Atmos mix. If you think about it, that's pretty incredible. And um, I think that side of things will hopefully develop, and then, and then if it does, then it'd be easier to get involved in mastering without all these weird workarounds where you've got to like copy the same EQ a hundred times to, to. To that being to, said, yeah. Do you think that Atmos will take off in homes? It don't matter how good it gets for the mastering. Well, it's that's still... the main thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. and um, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I've heard some of these sound bars, for example, and I've heard the the obviously the AirPod, Air, you know, the, the AirPods and the AirPod Pros, and sometimes stuff sounds good, and sometimes it sounds terrible. Mm. It, it's 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 in its infancy. I don't think anyone's really truly worked out how to make stuff consistently consistently sound great in that format, which translates to all the products that are available for the consumer to buy. Because it's so much, it's so much more complicated than... Your Rocketman Atmos is still the gold standard of Atmos mixes. That was one of the very first ones yeah. I did. Yeah. I heard it in Capitol Studios in LA, and 
in 2018. And in my defence, I was very hungover. But when, <laughs> when the chorus happened, I wept. It yeah, was yeah. Like, cause it's know. just out on the piano there, yeah. and then the backing yeah. vocals yeah, just yeah, come yeah. at you from every end. Who gives a shit if it sounds like the stereo? It's such a dumb yeah. standard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like if you're going to do it, fucking do it. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, you don't want things moving, but you want things spread. Yeah, yeah, yeah the totally. majority of them. Oh, shit. Yeah, that yeah. one way. Greg did <laughs> amazing. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> what are you reading? And, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the bodies of the Dolby Labs. Yeah, that yeah. is oh, it. so it goes yeah. down. But the, 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 the second like thing, when, when it goes down to yeah. headphones, I don't know if it's because we all listen well, be, critically yeah. all the time, but I just don't hear any dimension at all. But it's the, the, the same binaural thing yeah. that does not work. No. But you'd think it'd be the same as any mix, where if, the better it sounds in the studio, the better it's going to sound to the consumer anyway, because like, yeah. it's going to, you know. It works in a car. I heard a car with Atmos, oh, and yeah. that, like, that's amazing. Interesting. Yeah. But, as long as you're sitting on the gear stick. But on your <laughs> 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 Whatever does it for you, John. That's <laughs> good. Uh, that's good. That's good. That's good. That's <laughs> yeah, we should, before we should finish on that, a big thank you to Nikki for, for setting yeah, all this up for yeah, us and you, everyone at Air. Thank you. Thank you. to hear what somebody you knew what they were supposed to sound like at the time because people yeah. turn around later on and mess with these things. I know I know and I'm interested in the original intent well that's why I'm here tonight talking with I'm the dinosaur yeah. I come from that that background and John is is the more modern mastering engineer and he has to deal with problems that I never had to deal with as a mastering engineer and that was the great thing because with EMI the training was you had to go through mastering before you could become an engineer.